Good day, fellow viewer, and welcome back to a new episode of Hammer D20. Today, we're going to complete our in-depth coverage of the Hamilton Film Festival, as well as speak to a local theater company that yours truly is heavily involved in, and see what they're planning for the holiday season. So at the Film Festival, when of the films have finished screening per category, the directors and creators and makers and writers of the films had a chance to get up on the stage and conduct a Q&A. While I was there, I got a chance to speak to some of the people who were directors and makers of these films and see their opinions, where you can kind of ask them about why they made the films, what inspired them, and so on. So, I spoke to Lavina Yavari, Lance Fernandez, and Anna Chan, the trio who created, wrote, acted, and edited together the now award-winning short film Red String of Fate, and Dane Sicelli, the director and writer of another film in the emerging category, Overplay. Both films that I had covered in the previous episode. I asked them about... S you know what, maybe I'll just leave the question for the actual interview. Stephen, over to you. Thank you, Stephen. And so, I guess, to ask, uh, what is Red String of Fate? Red String of Fate is basically a love story between two people in a very futuristic sci-fi world where possibility is completely endless, like anything can happen. And, um, and you get to see these two character when they're at the most desperate moment, what are they doing to, to preserve most important essence of their love? You know, I've watched it at the at the Hamilton Film Festival. How was that experience? You know, kind of going to the Hamilton Film Festival, then submitting that, and you know, getting it screened and seeing it on the live screen. No, it was it was just fun to be out in general and then see everything together. It's so different than just watching it online. So we really got to feel the audience and have an experience with the film. Exactly. Yeah, I, 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 it was a good thing that they were able to, you know, the things were opening up at the, at the exact right time and you're able to actually see it in a theater, right? Yeah, like throughout each of these festivals, like we, I love the online ones as well because like we got to connect with people from other parts of the world that we wouldn't have normally met. Um, but like, yeah, in person here, just like, finding out people's process throughout the pandemic like you know me, this might have been like also I think for another filmmaker their first time seeing it in a theater um and like we also when we won our competition to have have our movie made we got in-kind services from Urban Post we got coloring by like uh, Alter Ego so this was actually a first time seeing it and it's like the version that you're meant to see it in it was it was like meant to be in a the theater especially the sound so that was really nice as a filmmaker to sit back and be like, okay, everything sounds good. I don't have to fix anything. <laughs> <laughs> you know, seeing the little, the little robot going around, the lighting, the, the, the setting, you did what a filmmaker is supposed to do is completely take you out of the world of like you're in reality and put you into, here's a, here's a f fictional setting for, for, for myself. That's my congratulations to yourselves for doing <laughs> such a great job for that. Yeah. Our uh, artist, Steve, who built the robots, like we were very lucky to have him on board. Yeah, he had already built those. So we were able to use our connections to include into the film. So um, so th those robots, those themselves didn't cost $4,000 and all that <laughs> stuff. We have far more because like, the movie was like only 10 minutes. So we could only showcase like certain characters. There was, there's way more robots. So like we do plan to make this into a feature film. So we will definitely incorporate the other ones. Excellent. Yeah. And at the beginning of the film, you see a life-size Terminator like robot. So, and it, that was fully functional. Obviously with the film like this, uh, something like that cyberpunk uh, that takes inspiration from something, but what would you say is your inspiration or something that you saw? They're like, whoa, like, the, like it helped you kind of make this. Terminator, Ghost in the Shell. Like when I saw T2 as a kid, like I just remember like, I wanna be in something like this or like make something like this one day. It's so cool. Like, just like, I've always been attracted to animatronics. I'm a RPG gamer and I, I love 
video games and animate where like the world is completely like just so many possibilities. So when I hit up Lavina, I'm like, hey, let's do something, but it involves robots and in this futuristic cyberpunk science fiction world, we're like, yes, game on. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. And it seems like that's like a scene or like a setting or a character that would appear in something like Final Fantasy VII or something like that. That's like yeah. kind of, kind of <laughs> the idea, right? Uh, as a future film, what, what, what are you planning for the future? There we go, yeah. Uh, basically, we're just going to expand upon the story that you saw in the short. There's the, there's a huge universe, and these are just a couple of the characters that are within it. So we kind of want to like continue that, make a feature. I want to make another short film that's in that universe. We want to start our production company and just kind of pump out like a movie a year or something. That would be yeah, a cyberpunk, sci-fi, mm-hmm. kind of all within that sort of genre and universe, and really expand from the short into different stories absolutely it's kind of like there and there's a lot of uh a lot of room for ideas and creativity for exactly like a kind of like a near future that's like like i guess dystopian is the right word because there's a billion stories that can be told right now because there's eight billion people on the earth you know imagine what that would be in you know 100 years right for yourselves what got you into uh filming directing and this kind of this kind of field well, first I got into this because I had a band and we were trying to make our own music videos. And at that time, not many local bands had music videos. So from there, I started um, making my own videos and then started getting into, got into film school and made short films and mostly action and horror and sci-fi. And uh, I kept getting doing bigger and bigger short films until we got to got to this and also I did my own visual effects and editing. I came from a background of uh, Chinese opera singers. Okay. Um, my grandparents in China they I, I literally like, listen to them practice every single day so I grew up in that like performance world and like to me it's very natural to like I thought I wanted to be a performer but uh, I end up taking on makeup instead. So I've become a makeup artist for the past 15 years of my life. And also like illustrate, I was a graphic design first actually, and I was a programmer. And like through that, I always loved like just computer and art together. And when I got into acting, I was like, oh, I really want to tell a story that's a cyberpunk theme. That's a sci-fi theme slash animate inspired slash of just out of boundary love storytelling, you know, just, just love storytelling that can open up people's imagination. Like I want to tell stories like that. Me, uh, I've always been into filmmaking. When I was in high school, I had a friend that I would make like little short films with. Um, I, I started, I worked in film originally behind the scenes, building props and doing animatronics. And while I was doing that, I got really into modeling. And so I would art direct all my own photo shoots and I would want them to look like stills from movies that I wanted to one day direct, but I never got around to it. Thank you so much for your time, uh, a crew of Red String of Faith. Uh, I'll uh, probably just throw it back to you, Steve. Thanks, Stephen. So, Dane, uh, what is Overplay? Well, Overplay is a 28 minute short film. It's a crime thriller about a bunch of broke students who attempt to rob their drug dealer. Uh, how was the, I guess, the experience yourself being at the Hamilton Film Festival? And it was surreal. I mean, I, I, I loved it. I had been working on it nonstop. I mean, I also edited it along like writing and directing and producing. Mm. Um, so I was really close to it, if you know what I mean. Like I had seen it probably a thousand times and then I got away from it, you know, for months, you know, we finished it earlier this year, I think in February and then started applying to festivals and uh, finally getting to see it on the big screen with an audience of people was, it was great. I mean, I got to watch it with the cast. We did like a Zoom thing because people are spread out over Hamilton, Ottawa, Toronto kind of thing. Um, And that's awesome, right? But actually, you know, being in the room with people and, and seeing people reacting at certain parts and and then, you know, overplay ends on a big bang, as you know. Um, and then see, you know, like when the credits come up and people cheer and clap, it was, I it couldn't have gone better in my opinion. Oh, that's, it, mm, it's just like perfect, kind of like the direct, uh, there's a word for it, the direct um, satisfaction that your work yeah. turned into something, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess the question uh, is, uh, why did you make overplay? Why, why, why did you make this film? Good question. <laughs> um, well, I, uh, I'm a big proponent of, you know, when you're starting your career as an artist, I think um, finding your niche is something that, at least something that I'm trying to do. 
I know there's people may want to do a bunch of different things and I'd certainly do as well, mm. but at least to start out, I am very interested in, you know, crime fiction. Um, not necessarily true crime, like a lot of people love, but um, more towards the uh, maybe thieves, like heisty movies. And I like, I love mafia movies and uh, that kind of stuff. Right. So essentially I wanted to make a heist movie and I wanted to make a crime thriller and I had no money. <laughs> and so I had to write something around, you know, what I thought would be achievable. You know, I was a broke student when, when I wrote it and uh, <laughs> coming up with ways for doing something that I would never actually do in real life. But um, uh, kind of just writing around what I know and being able to, to write a heist movie that we could pull off, you know, we're not oh, Danny Ocean robbing the Bellagio or anything, but um, yeah, that's kind of kind of where it came from. Right. And it's like that the idea is kind of it, it's relatable in a sense that you can kind of get that idea of sometimes when you're in that position, but someone that you're like oriented with and you see them can maybe like flaunting the money kind of yeah. being like, man, <laughs> like, you know, always have that, that devil on your shoulder being like, it would be so easy to steal it. Right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> right. And are there any kind of specific films or like like things that you found that, that inspired you to kind of make this or that you took uh, inspiration from? It's tough to say exactly. I think, you know what, actually, I was thinking about this. I mean, I'm a huge Tarantino fan and, you know, Pulp Fiction is, was, that's kind of what made me fall in love with cinema. I would watch it like once a month. And then if I meet a new person, they, I'd meet them and they tell me, oh, what's your favorite movie? Yeah, Pulp Fiction. Oh, I never seen it. You've never seen it? No, we got to watch it together. And then <laughs> I would be the most annoying person to watch it with because I'm like <laughs> quoting it the whole time. Oh, we got to watch this scene. It's really good. And then <laughs> so Tarantino, I love, I love Guy Ritchie movies, especially um, the convoluted nature of his first couple of movies. Like if you've seen Lock, Sock and Two Smoking Barrels or Snatch, it's like, how does this all fit together? And then you watch it a bunch of times and, you know, Overplay has that kind of convoluted nature of it too, where you're jumping in the past and someone's telling a story. Is this actually happening? We're watching it happen, but, you know, is, or is it just the way he's telling it kind of thing? Well, so, Overplay was essentially written to be watched twice, right? So you get it to the end. By the end, you get the whole thing. And then there's like that last kind of reveal. And then now you can watch it again. And you, there's like kind of little hints here and there. And just in the way that we shot it of uh, being able to try to tell kind of all the twists and turns in it. Uh, okay, cool, cool, cool. Like that. Right. So uh, for the future, what are you hoping to do? Are you hoping to continue making films or extend this? Yeah. or? Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. Hoping that, no, I'm pretty, you know, this project's done and over with, and it's nice to be able to, um, you know, networking is a big part of, of filmmaking or really any industry. Um, so now I'm able to show people kind of what I was able to do with on my own with no money with like a, basically almost a one man show. Um, but now, yeah, I have, I have, I've been writing a lot, you know, uh, writing doesn't cost anything, which is the beauty of it. It's just, your blood, sweat, and tears, pretty much. <laughs> and um, so I've been writing. I have a short film written that I wrote a, a good, probably two years ago now, that um, I would love to make, and it would need to have money behind it, essentially. <laughs> the thing about Overplay is it's all guys. There's no women in it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this, this other script that I wrote is a female-centered story, female-driven. The two main characters are women, and uh, it would need... Uh, a female filmmaker's voice on it actually I wouldn't want to direct it myself I would love to find a collaborative partner to work with and then I could write and produce it and then she could direct it potentially I I, I really believe in this project and I think it could do really well and I hmm. think it could definitely get some money and uh, I think it's something that people would really love to see so how would someone be able to see overplay so we just released it on YouTube um, so anyone can watch it if they'd like it's uh, if you go to Masterless Productions um it's a that's the youtube channel that it's under and it's uh overplay short film fantastic perfect okay uh thank great. you for your time dana appreciate you coming on oh I'll, thanks for having uh, me this was great excellent I, i'll just throw it back to you steve thank you steven before we move on to our next segment let's take a short break see you soon welcome back now, some of you might or might not know this, but I've been involved with live theater and acting since I was a child. 
I purposely got into the school of journalism because I figured that acting was an unrealistic life goal to try to achieve. That you have to move down to Hollywood and then become a waiter and then spend four hours every day driving down the Santa Ana freeway in Los Angeles, wondering to yourself, why would anyone live in this forsaken land that God hasn't set his eyes on? And then wish that people would just, that is, until I realized that Hamilton is actually a great enough home for not only acting, but of course, local theater. And the theater company that I've been involved with is Theater Ancaster a company that is situated in, you guessed it, Ancaster, and has been there since the 1990s, and has put on such great performances like Annie, Hairspray, in Chicago. Ah, oh, look, who's that odd fellow? In recent years, Theater Ancaster will put on a radio play production of a known story or holiday film. In 2018, they put on the production of Miracle on 34th Street, and in 2019, they put on It's a Wonderful Life. So I spoke to Al Kroksoff, one of the founding members and directors of Theater Ancaster, about the company, how it's been running it, and what they have planned for this holiday season. Because oh, you might be seeing more of this guy's face all over it. <laughs> Stephen, over to you. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, now, Al, uh, obviously I'm well involved with this production, but uh, for the audience, uh, what production are we working on at Theater Ancaster right now? <laughs> Now, this is a, a simulated radio broadcast of uh, the Lux Radio Theater production of It's a Wonderful Life. And this is, I think, the third time we've done this. It's a, a, a kind of Christmas tribute, and uh, all our proceeds go to the Ancaster Community Services Christmas Fund. And all, everybody who works on it uh, does it as a volunteer. There are no paid crew or anything like that. It's just strictly a volunteer. And um, we set it up as a radio broadcast. But this year... The difference is that we couldn't have an audience, so we're doing it virtually. Right. Of course. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I definitely, at a minimum, at least, uh, you'll you'll have me advertising it on both uh, Hammer D20 and my own uh, social media. So, you know, for whatever reason, uh, why, why would I be advertising it, huh? <laughs> Well, uh, you happen to be you happen to be George Bailey in this show, so that, that's probably a pretty good reason for advertising. You, you seem to be the lead. Yeah, exactly, right? We had to skip last year entirely, but then, but this is the fourth time we've done it. Theater Ancaster used has all has done a uh, a show at Christmas as a benefit for the community services for a, a long time. I don't know, ten years or more. Mm. And, and we started off doing it at the old town hall in Ancaster, and then we switched over to our uh, old fire hall arts center. And we've been doing it, and we it was a live kind of uh, production of a, a number of uh, of our groups, youth groups, adult groups, and we put a little band together. And then we thought, well, now let's just see if we can change it up a bit. And we decided to do these Lux Radio Theater productions. And we've done uh, it's a Wonderful Life, and we've done the uh, Miracle on 34th Street. So those are two. next year, if everything works out, we'll do a Christmas carol. Oh, excellent. Okay. Beautiful. Good to hear. And and and, and I don't know, maybe you could be Scrooge if you win the, <laughs> win the part. <laughs> Although you're uh, more of a Bob Cratchit. Thing. <laughs> yeah, I'll, 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 that, that will be difficult. And if I can do it, I'll be, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll surprise myself. <laughs> but uh, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see. Um, I'll definitely audition, that's for sure. Um, but uh, as Theater Ancaster as a whole, um, uh, when did you start directing, participating in the organization? Well, right at the beginning, in the mid-90s. Mid we started actually in uh, 92 with a, as, a, as more of a community theater uh, under the auspices of the uh, Ancaster Arts Council. And then we branched out to, to be Theater Ancaster. And I think our first official year was 97. And I've been involved right from the start. It just which I just what I decided to do when I retired from teaching was to become to incorporate theater Ancaster, and it went on from there. I I was the president for a while, and then other people have been taking over the leadership, and, and uh, it just started in '97. It just kind of grew like some sort of mushroom ever then. And I guess how how was that? Like you said, founding member. Like how was that process? Well, the process was that we had been doing these. Um, performances at, with the Ancaster Arts Council. And then we just decided, Gord Conroy, Ralph Hackenberg and I one day that we would just, uh, because we wanted to do it our way, we just decided to form Theater Ancaster. And then we started with one production and then we added a couple of years later, another a spring production. Then we started a uh, youth program. We have quite a 
a large youth program. And then we started a chorus and, and you know, we, we, we have a seniors program now. My, my wife and Chris and I and Gord Conroy and his partner, we lead the classics company, which is uh, for people 55 and over. And we're on hold this year because we because of COVID. But we've done uh, the first year we did. We produced a, a play, and we also produced a, a, a concert version of South Pacific. And we hope to get back to that uh, next year. So you know, us older folks, we uh, we look after this group and the, the the sort of next generation have been working on the main stage plays. We hope to get uh, into our new Ancaster Memorial Arts Complex early in the spring of 2022. And uh, we're just hopeful, fingers crossed, that everything works out for that on time. Right, yeah. And I remember that whole plan when it was working on Chicago, which I'll, I'll, I'll get into in a sec. Um, uh, that arts complex, can, can you kind of go into a bit about what that was? Yes, the Anscarcher Art Center was a, is, is a, a new repurposed old schoolhouse that was on the middle of the Ancaster main drag. And a few years ago, a number of people in the community, including Theatre Ancaster, thought, what a great place to have an art center because the school board didn't want it anymore. And so Lloyd Ferguson, our local counselor, and Bob Wilkins, a local businessman, really spearheaded this drive. And uh, we raised money from the city and from the federal government and locally and funded this nice art center. It's going to have a 450 seat auditorium and many of the arts groups in Ancaster are going to uh, operate there, including Theatre Ancaster. And I think we're just about the uh, the prime tenant. It opens to, we hope to open it uh, next spring in uh, 22, sometime in April, we hope, and uh, have our first show there. Other than obviously the productions that I've been involved with, Al, uh, what was your favorite production that you've ever worked on? <laughs> Well, yeah, I knew you were going to ask me that question. I thought, boy, there are a number. Of, uh, I really have worked on productions that I like to work on, you know. <laughs> but I think Oklahoma was maybe my favorite. And uh, it, it, that was back in 90, 2005, I think, when we did Oklahoma. And uh, it was really quite quite charming to do. It's such an uplifting, positive piece. It's, it's great music, and I had a wonderful cast and crew to work with. And I guess that was my favorite to do. Although, although I've enjoyed working on quite a few... <laughs> these things one way not always i don't always direct sometimes i help produce and, and sometimes i just stay in the background and just do little jobs that need to be done with uh you mentioned future working on uh, uh, a christmas carol uh for, as a radio play uh are there any plans for future um like stage productions yeah, I think we have a in the spring when we get rolling at the art center we're going to start off with a uh with a uh, a pop concert it's going to be the you know the the, the latest uh invasion by the brits it's yes. going to be our first uh pop concert and then and then we ho we hope to uh begin our book shows there with uh, oliver and uh, beyond there i really i really shouldn't speculate <laughs> oh of course yeah there's no. going to be some summer we're going to do some work in the summer too where there's going to be a uh, a young adult production in the summer of college and university students and uh, we'll see how that goes. And they, they, they also hope to do a um, a play in the summer, uh, a Norm Foster play, this which is which we hope to do. That's next summer. But uh, for those who don't know, how does how would one participate in Theater Ancaster? Uh, go to our website, theaterancaster.com, and they click on the audition button, and you can audition. Or if you look for just information, you just send your information to info at theaterancaster.com and you can become part of our production crews. Uh, we're, we're always campaigning to find people who are interested in building and decorating sets and, and putting together costumes and, and uh, arranging props and all that sort of thing. So it's a, you know, there's always something to do. I, I won't I won't see anybody turned down who says I'd like to help in some way or other. Many of the people are volunteers. Many of the people who, who participate with Theatre Ancaster are, are volunteers. We we do have we do give honoraria to the to the to some of the leaders of some of the departments and that sort of thing. But uh, it's uh, it we really do rely on our volunteers to do a lot of the work. Oh, exactly. Uh, when will uh, it's a wonderful life be available to people to watch? 
I hope it'll be available right after the 1st of December. I'm just about finished the editing, trying to tease out, you know, a few, <laughs> try to tease out a few things because we had to do some uh, recording out of sequence sometimes. And then uh, uh, once I get that done and then we'll, we'll try it out to make sure it makes sense and is uh, easily downloadable, then we'll uh, put out a link to it probably around the 1st or 2nd of December. The link will be available to uh, the uh, theater and caster people and all their all the members and people on their mailing list. And uh, it's all right if they pass it on to other people. It's a it's going to be available to the public. We're not going to put the link in the paper. I don't think I'm not quite sure about that and what mm. the marketing is going to be. Mm. But the link will be available, and I think we'll leave it up there until the end of the Christmas season. So uh, so thank you for your time, Al, and I'll just throw it back to you, Steve. Thank you, Stephen, and thank you for your time, Al. That's all we have for this episode of Hammer D20. Before I sign off completely, there's a few messages I'd like to share with you. Theater Ancaster's radio play production of It's a Wonderful Life will go live sometime in the middle of December and will be shared through their online newsletter. It will be accessible through Google Drive, so once it gets released, you can just have to follow the link and watch the video. Although viewing it is free, you can make a donation to Theater Ancaster towards their Ancaster Community Service donation. If you're not connected to their newsletter, you can contact Theater Ancaster via email at info at theaterancaster.com to see when the performance goes live. Otherwise, you'll see me posting about it on Facebook, and I'll be sharing that link. A new board game cafe is popping up in Hamilton. The Bard and Bear, located at 237 James Street North, is just finishing up its last steps of opening up and will be open later in December. I plan on interviewing the owners of this episode, but since they weren't finished the interior of their store yet, I figured I'd rather showcase the store at its prettiest. Anyway, look out for the Bard and Bear in downtown James Street throughout this holiday season. And a new local board game has just been released. Yabuka is a crazy, twisted word game where you're given lettered coffee bean tiles. You have to spell out words using these tiles. But your opponent can always steal your words if they can create new words through adding letters or turning them around in different directions to form something else. It's hectic family fun that you'll be thinking, who would ever want to play Scrabble ever again? You can get yourself a copy of it via their website. So if those pique your interest, you'll see more of that in the next episode of Hammer D20, which will start the next season after the holiday break. It's in the end of January, beginning of February. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you soon. I wish you all a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. And Happy New Year, eventually. Yeah.